Good Erev Shabbos, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful Purim. This week's Pasha is that of Tzav. Here we have many of the laws in regard to the offerings, and also we have the dedication service of Aaron and his sons to be Kahanim. One of the mitzvahs in this week's Pasha is in regard to the sin offering, the Korban Chattas, in which it states that if some of the meat from the chattis, which can be consumed by the kohen, if that meat is cooked in a vessel, then that which the vessel absorbs from its flavor is considered nosa. Nosa means when the meat is left over beyond its designated time in which it can be consumed. The offering of a sin offering, that meat, after the various parts are put on the altar, the rest of the meat is permissible for the Kohen to eat, and he can eat it that day and the following night. Once it reaches dawn, then it no longer can be consumed and it must be burned. So what happens if he took a vessel and he cooked the meat? And now the flavor of the meat has become absorbed into the vessel. Just like if we cook meat, it becomes a fleshic vessel, a meat vessel, because of the flavor that has been absorbed. Here, too, it's a sin offering vessel. And if it goes beyond the period of dawn, then it's considered that it's left over, and that's prohibited. So therefore, the Torah says that if it should be a copper or metal vessel, then it can be koshered. Just like we kosher our vessels, we'll We'll wash it out, and we'll let it uh, sit for a day, and then we'll boil it out, burn it out. <clears throat> That's how we kasha metal. But what if it's an earthenware vessel? If it's an earthenware vessel, we know that earthenware, pure earthenware, cannot be kasha in that method. Therefore, the Torah says, An earthenware vessel in which the sin offering meat was cooked, and thereby it gets absorbed into the walls of the vessel, yishover, the vessel must be broken. And the only way to kosher it is really not koshering, but destroying the vessel. We destroy it by breaking it so it no longer can contain anything. And that's enough, it's no longer a vessel. And it lost its characteristic of vessel, and that's sufficient. The question that is asked is that this law of the sacrificial meat, which has been cooked into a vessel, and that we must see that it is not left over in the vessel and we have to kosher it, or by an earthenware vessel break it, is not limited to just a sin offering. It also applies to a peace offering, <clears throat> carbon shlamin. And the carbon shlamim, there are parts that are put on the altar, parts that are given to the Kohen, parts that are given to the person, the Israelite, who brought the offering. And they too, when they cook it, it is subject to the same law. So the question is, why would the Torah present this law of koshering the vessels that have absorbed the sanctity of the flavor of the sacrificial meat? Why does it present it? specifically in regard to the sin offering. The Klei Yokar discusses this, and he says, indeed, if the Torah just wanted to inform us as to how to kosher the vessel that absorbed the flavor of the sacrificial meat, it did not have to specify the sin offering. But the Torah is alluding to a second law. And the reason why it specifies a sin offering is because the Torah is telling us not only does the sin offering flavor manifest itself and permeate the walls of the vessel in which it's cooked, but every sin that a human being performs manifests and permeates the walls of the essence of that human being. How do we kosher the human being who has been exposed and engaged in behavior which is sinful? And to that, the Torah says it depends. Just like by a vessel, there are some vessels which are strong and they're not that porous and they're metal, copper, 
whatever it might be, a metal, these can be kashed easily. And there are human beings <clears throat> who perhaps we're all flesh and blood and moral and mortal, and we make mistakes, and we realize the mistakes that we've made. Maybe we said something in anger, frustration, or just a foolish statement. Maybe we did something that we shouldn't have done and we regret it. These people who are recognized and are cognizant of their mistakes and they regret, they immediately feel terrible. And either they'll give some tzedakah or they'll ask Hashem to forgive them. If they did something wrong to another human being, they'll ask for forgiveness. These people can be cautioned when they feel within them that the walls of their soul and body have absorbed the flavor of sin, they can kasha themselves. These are the righteous individuals. But what about the rest of us? We who are more comparable to the earthenware vessel, that when we sin, once it gets in, can't get it out. We might not even be aware that our behavior is sinful or that we're transgressing. We can rationalize in our minds that, oh, I can say this and I can do that. And oh, it's not so terrible. And look at that one. And that's the way the world is today. And compared to others, oh, I'm terrific. We're not even aware how the sin has permeated our character, our thoughts, our minds. <clears throat> We're like the earthenware vessel. We have to be broken. How do we? What does that mean to be broken? It means that the thought process, the corruption of values, the lack of sensitivity to a sinful behavior, that has to be broken. Not the human being, heaven forbid. A person should never walk around depressed or upset. God wants us to be happy, to serve him, cheerful, creative, energetic. But if I think and I realize that I've done something which is truly wrong, I need to break that. But how? How does one who lives in the dark, how do we become all of a sudden enlightened and realize that I have to break this behavior pattern? This is achieved not by some remarkable in-depth study, <clears throat> not by immersing ourselves in prayer, although these are wonderful things, but by opening our eyes and looking at the world around us and saying to ourselves, what's going on here and where is the truth? We know that this coronavirus had brought us down, it locked us up, it has, it has literally, it has reshaped the way we think and the way we behave. Who knows, there might be people for the rest of their lives wearing masks and afraid to leave their homes. And maybe they're right. The CDC just recently came out and said, that because of the lockdown and the isolation, there was an increase of 29 point something percent, almost 30% increase in heart attacks. And there was a 32% increase in strokes. And there was an almost 50% increase in the rate of dementia and Alzheimer's of those people who are isolated. These are startling statistics. And a virus, an invisible virus, brought hysteria, chaos, and made us realize how mortal we truly are. Well, now the virus is almost behind us, and life is good. And now we're sitting and we have an incident in the Ukraine, in which we have a, a world leader <clears throat> threatening with nuclear war. Who knows what our lives shall be like? Should we answer? Should we show strength? Who knows what this person will do? They're capable of anything. Life is short. Where, where do we find? Where's our guidance? Where's our purpose? Where's our compass? 
to help us understand what life is truly and really about. Some people talk about, oh, we're going to fix the world. We're going to improve the world. We're going to change the culture. And we're still standing on the threshold of destruction and insanity. I think somehow we're missing our true moral compass and our direction in life. And that is found very simply when we say man does not have the answers. The answers are never found with man. Man can raise the questions. Man is capable of magnificent things. But the answers for the truth of life that comes only in our recognition and submission to our creator. We look at our lives and we say, God, without you, there is no purpose, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no responsibility. There is total corruption and chaos. Oh, there might be those who are very successful and they don't have God in their lives, only to find out that perhaps there were things behind closed doors that are too shameful to even discuss. So how do we break? How we, the earthenware vessels that are so porous and absorbed a behavior pattern so sinful, how do we break it? By recognizing that we are indeed mortal and that it is God who has given us all our gifts and has given us a path to happiness, success, true nachas from our children, and a portal to the world to come. When we think very simply about this, stop blaming this one, blaming that one, looking for this, looking for that, whatever it might be. When we look inside, within ourselves, to fix the world, the Chavetz Chaim says, starts with fixing ourselves. When we look within ourselves and we realize, I need to make God an act partner in my life. I need to find out not what I want and what God should do for me, but what is it that God wants that I should do and fulfill my purpose. That's how we break the earthenware vessel. That's how we reshape and recasher ourselves, our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Let's utilize the magnificence of Purim, God being there for us at our darkest moment when all of Kalal Yisrael faced annihilation from Haman and Achashverosh. And miraculously, the Nahapilchu, he turned it all around. May we be worthy of seeing the Nahapilchu again. May we see the hand of God revealed to all mankind. May we see his beloved Kalal Yisrael shining as a beacon unto the world as we recognize and sense the presence of the Almighty within our daily activities. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay Jewish. Have a great Shabbos.